Good morning, guys. Surprise, it's me again. Hey, we get to hang out all morning long. And um, again, my name is Clayton York, and I get to lead the young adult ministry here at the church. I'm gonna tell you something. I have a lot of energy. So I hope that you guys are ready for it this morning. Look, you guys are the 1045 service. So you've already had your coffee. You've already had your energy drink. Some of you are on, on coffee number five, like myself, if you can't tell. <laughs> so we're gonna have some fun. Um, I just wanna say first and foremost, thank you guys. Thank you guys for praying for my wife and I a couple weeks ago as we were stuck in Moab, Utah. I have had multiple people come up to me and say, hey, what's the whole story? Or super glad you're back. Or you should have stayed. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and just kind of explain, get this out there so you can under, understand uh, the story behind this. So my wife and I, a couple weeks ago, wanted to go on a three-day camping trip to Moab, Utah. It's one of our bucket list items to do. It's beautiful there. Um, so I ended up buying this um, older Ford Raptor. We, we like to go like off-roading and overlanding. If you don't know what overlanding is, it's literally putting a tent on top of a roof rack and going to places where you can only drive. And so we, we loved this. We overlanded the Raptor and we were on our way. Y'all, we got to camp in some of, the, some of the coolest spots, I feel like, in this country. We camped in Monument Valley. If you've never been there, you should definitely go see Monument Valley. Um, and then we got to Moab, camped a couple nights there, and saw some really cool things. On our last day in, in Moab, um, there was this, this place that I wanted to go camp. It's this rim that literally overlooks all of Moab. And so I'm excited about it. My wife and I, are, we're just like eager. And we, we literally drive up this mountain, um, and we come up over this hill to get to this spot. And as we come up over this hill, I'm pressing the gas, and then all of a sudden, I have no more gas. And then I realize all of the icons on my dashboard are just blinking like crazy, right? So I lose all power to the truck, pull off to the right-hand side, and I look at my wife and I say, I think the truck just died. And she's like, there's no way that's, that's true. We just got it. And long story short, it was very true. Um, there, were, there were cars passing us, and I, I got out and checked every fuse in this thing. I disconnected the battery, connected the battery. Um, I couldn't figure it out, so I decided to call a mobile mechanic. There are three mobile mechanics, mechanics in Moab. Two of them said, sorry, I can't get you till tomorrow, because that's how they all talk there. Um, one of them said, I'll be there in 10 minutes. Cool. 45 minutes later, this guy shows up. He's wearing cargo shorts with a T-shirt and flip-flops. He's about four or five, and I'm like, great, we're in great hands here. So he starts looking all over the truck, diagnosing all these problems, and three hours later, he cannot figure it out. He said, well, you're in good hands. Um, there's one dealership in Moab, and it is a Ford dealership. And so he said, here's what I can do. I will tow you down to the dealership so you don't have to call a tow, a tow company. He had a 1985 Forerunner with 360,000 miles on it. He said, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna get a tow strap, put it to, to my bumper, and I'm gonna tie it to your front bumper, and we're just gonna ride, ride this down the mountain. And I was like, you've gotta be outside your mind. So I literally rode the brakes, scariest thing in the world, down this mountain with no power steering whatsoever. And so end up pulling into the uh, Ford dealership, um, Make a longer story shorter. They said, your whole PCM, the computer system to your truck, just went out. And um, we're going to have to order you a new one. Well, that's good news, because there was one in the entire country. And so they said, we can have it here by Friday. This was Tuesday. I was supposed to be home on Wednesday. I said, babe, looks like we're staying in Moab a couple, couple more days. And so we, uh, we stay in Moab. We don't have a car. We're walking everywhere, going to the same restaurant every single day. We, can't, we literally can't do anything we went to go do. And I'm frustrated at this point. We are stuck in, in Moab. And so Friday rolls around, and I'm like, babe, this is the day we get to go home today. We get to the Ford dealership, and um, they say, well, the part's not in. I said, you're joking me, right? It's been a couple days. We rush ordered this. The part should be in. They said, yeah, it's not going to get here till Monday. I said, babe, looks like we're staying in Moab a couple more days. <laughs> Y'all, this three-day three getaway turned into a marriage retreat for my wife and I. I promise you, we are frustrated, confused, and y'all, we were stuck. And so we had to stay over the weekend. I didn't want to stay in another hotel, so I decided, hey, we're going we're gonna to do what we came here to do. So I looked up. We, we rented a 1986 Volkswagen Vanagon. 
Y'all don't know what I'm talking about? This is what my wife and I were rolling around Moab in for, for the whole weekend. And um, it, was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, go to the next picture. And this is for all my 80s and, uh, and older. I know what it was like to road trip back in your day now. No, I get it. Actual maps you have to look at. There's no computer electronics in the car whatsoever. But hey, we made it work. We got to see some really cool places. Um, I actually got that stuck down somebody else's driveway that I didn't know where I was. Turns out it was two-wheel drive, not four-wheel drive. So, y'all, the whole trip just kept getting stuck and stuck and stuck and stuck. So, Monday comes around. We show up to the Ford dealership, and um, I'm expecting the part to be in, right? <laughs> Joke's on me. Part was not in. They said, sorry, shipment hasn't come in yet. I said, well, that's fun, because I'm going to stay here until these shipments come in. So, a couple hours later... Shipment comes in, the part is finally there. My wife and I are rejoicing and jumping up and down. Change the PCM, and we are on our way. Finally, 20 minutes down the road, my wife is driving, and she starts pressing the gas, and there is no gas. She said, babe, I think the truck just died. <laughs> I said, you have got to be kidding me. This is not reality right now. So we pull off to the side of the road, 20 minutes away from the dealership, and same issues, same issues. So I call the Ford dealership. I'm like, look, you guys have got to come tow us back to where you are. You need to fix this problem. And so literally, hours later, we're still there, and, and they send a tow truck. At this point, I'm like, babe, let's just burn the truck. We have better luck burning the truck and renting bicycles to ride home at this point. We'll be, we'll be home sooner. And so they tow us back to the Ford dealership, um, and turns out it was just a fuse that blew that time. I didn't know what fuse to check, and so we got towed back, and it was closing time, and I said, look, you changed the fuse, but I'm bringing this back to you in the morning because you're going to diagnose every single problem that is going on with this thing because I'm not leaving until I know that this isn't going to happen again. So we stayed in Moab one more day, right? This, this three-day trip turned into like an eight, nine-day trip. We got to see all of Moab. It's, if you have questions, please come ask me. I can give tours at this point of Moab. Um, and to be honest, like if I think about it now, if I think about it now, I, the Sunday that we missed, that my wife and I missed, Pastor Charlton did stand up here and pray for us. He, y'all, he, he did pray for us that we would, this, this is y- y'all's fault. You know why? Because I think some of you guys only prayed that we'd get out of Moab. We got out of Moab, and that's as far as we got until we had to go back. Next time, pray that we make it home. Off my soapbox, thank you. So, so Monday rolls around. They, they fix it, um, we, Tuesday rolls around, they checked everything, we're good to go. So my wife and I hop in the truck and we're driving and everything is fine. Three and a half hours later, we stop in this town called Many Farms, Arizona. Okay, M-A-N-Y Farms, Arizona. Didn't know it existed and neither did anybody else except for the people that live there. So we stop at this gas station, get out, grab our snacks, fuel up, my wife gets in the driver's seat, turns over the truck, and you will never believe what happened. No crank, no gas, icons flashing as if something, the same thing is happening. And at this point, I look at my wife, and I'm like, look, every time you get in the driver's seat, this truck doesn't, I'm not letting you drive anymore, anywhere. So y'all, like, we were stuck. Three and a half hours away from Moab, five and a half hours away from home, and this decides, the truck decides (laughs) that it doesn't want to start Again, I'm like, are you kidding me? I just want to be home. I just want to be home. How was I supposed to trust God's plan if I couldn't even see God's goodness in the middle of everything going on in my situation? I wanted to be nice and do good. I wanted to love my wife and say everything is fine, but I couldn't do that at this point in time. I wanted people to see our situation and think, man, like a lot has happened to you guys, but you are strong and you are handling it. I wasn't handling it, okay? There was a lot going on and I was frustrated and confused and mad. And so I started thinking a lot about what would it look like to actually display goodness and be good in this situation? Where's God's goodness in the middle of all of this? Which brings us to where we're going to be this morning as we start coming down the mountain in this good life series and talk about the last couple, fruit of the Spirit. Today I want to talk about goodness. And y'all, that whole thing happened the week after Charlton talked about patience and I'm supposed to talk about goodness. So smack dab in the middle of patience and goodness, you find us in Moab, okay? 
Galatians 5.22 says this, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's actually a ton of scriptures that mention goodness. Psalm 107.1 says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. If you grew up in church, that's a song that you remember. You, y'all know it. Psalm 34.8, taste and see that the Lord is good. Romans 8.28 And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for, say it with me, good. Nahum 1.7, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. Romans 12.29, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with. And last but certainly not least, I love what Psalm 37, 3 and 5 says. Trust in the Lord and do good. Then you will live safely in the land and prosper. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him, and he will help you. And all of these are great verses. But what does goodness in Galatians 5.22 genuinely look like? What's the difference between simply just being good and displaying goodness? GCU did a study a couple years back, and they say this. Goodness is action. It's not something we do only for the sake of being virtuous. When we strive to be good only for our own benefit, It is not truly goodness that we possess. In Greek, the word goodness means uprightness of heart and life. And with that, the Bible tells us that the word good actually means holy, pure, and righteous. So goodness is birthed out of godliness. And if I were to take what GCU said and what the Bible says, this is what I'm going to give us this morning, which I hope is imprinted in your mind from here on out. Goodness comes from the overflow of your heart, not just the lending of your hand. Say it with me. Goodness comes from the overflow of your heart, not just the lending of your hand. And today I want to talk about a few people in the Bible who demonstrated this type of goodness. They saw someone who needed help, and out of the goodness in their hearts, they helped someone that other people walked past every single day. The story's crazy. Maybe you've heard it. Maybe you haven't but I just want to encourage us to lean in and trust God enough this morning to change our hearts from the inside out. But before we dive in, before we dive in, I want you to look at the person next to you and say, I'm going after goodness. Go ahead, tell them, tell them. Turn to your second choice who you don't like as much that you choose second and tell them this, I'm getting gooder. Come on, y'all. We're talking like young adults this morning. I'm getting gooder. Um, We're going to be in Acts chapter 3 this morning, so if you have your Bibles, please open them to Acts 3. If you've got your iPhones or iPads, please open the Bible app on there. And if you have an Android phone, do me a favor, put it on the ground in front of you and just kick it as far as you can under the seats, all right? Or the trash is on your way out. Uh, We're going to, let's pray. God, we thank you so much um, for who you are, for what your word says, for the power that is in the Bible. God, I pray that there's clarity today from from your word. God, will we go deeper, developing a more intimate relationship with you that we can genuinely see what goodness displayed looks like. Lord, we love you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Acts 3 verse 1. Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the three o'clock prayer service. As they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called the beautiful gate, so he could beg from the people going into the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. Peter and John looked at him intently, and Peter said, Look at us. The man looked at them eagerly, expecting some money. But Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you. And honestly, I'm going to pause for a second. I think this is where a lot of us get stuck. A lot of us get stuck in life. Peter said, Hey, man, I don't have what you're looking for. What what you're asking for, I I just don't have that. Um, And I think... Too many people, too many of us get stuck because we're so aware of everything we don't have, right? I don't, I don't have what they have, or I, I, don't, I don't have what, what I've always wanted, or I can't get what they are getting. Like We're all so aware of what we do not have that it keeps us in this stuck position. Why not think about everything you do have? And I love this because the passage doesn't just stop here. There's more to it. Peter said, I don't have that for you but I'll give you what I do have. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. 
Then Peter took this, the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. Very important. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up, stood on his feet, and began to walk. Then walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple with them. All the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. When they realized he was the lame beggar they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. They all rushed out in amazement to Solomon's colonnade where the man was holding tightly to Peter and John. Now, before we look into the goodness displayed by Peter and John and what that genuinely looks like, I want to talk about the lame man for a second. I want to talk about the man who was actually stuck, the man that they helped. How many of you guys... um, How many of you guys like flying, like in airplanes, (laughs) as if you can fly a different way? Um, Okay, let me me explain. There's nothing relaxing about flying to me whatsoever. And the reason for that is because of airports, all right? When I went to Africa a couple months ago, I didn't realize what I was getting myself into. I didn't know that that it was going to be 30 plus hours of travel time from here to London, eight hours over, over in London, from London to Qatar, from Qatar to in Tebby, um, like it was just stressful. Like it was stressful for me. And if you're like me, this is funny. Y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. If you're anything like me and you've got an aisle seat or a window seat, you always take your water bottle or your backpack and put it in the seat next to the middle one so that, so that people walking by don't take the middle seat. And then you've got a whole row to yourself, right? (laughs) Silly us, because as if we think people that didn't buy those tickets won't show up to their flight, right? But I always do that, and it never works out. Um, I like, I, I really find flying stressful and airports stressful. Like, it really does test your faith, and it really proves how much of the spirit you got. And if you don't believe me, fly spirit. Fly spirit airlines, and that will test all the spirit that you got. <laughs> airports are chaotic, and flights can be stressful, but you have to go through an airport to get to a destination. You just have to. As bad as I wanted a nonstop flight from here to Africa, that just doesn't exist. I had to go through an airport to get to a destination and to make a connection. But it's those connecting flights that are hard. And you know that. Why? Because you get to where you're going, and then you have 10 minutes to get from A3, take three trams, one bus that drops you off at Z99, right? And it's just impossible. It's those connecting flights that are hard, but there's always a saving grace. I love the saving grace. And if you put yourself in an airport right now, you can see it and you can picture it with me, the saving grace, also known as the moving walkway. (laughs) Yes, the moving walkway, something designed to get you further and faster than everyone else, unless everyone else is standing on a moving walkway. Right, And the problem, the problem to me is not the fact that you're standing. That's totally fine. Stand anywhere else in the airport that you want to stand. Just don't stand on the thing that was designed to get you further and faster than everyone else. Standing creates stagnation. Standing creates stagnation. And anytime you have stagnation in a place created for movement, you get frustrated. And I can't help but wonder if The reason so many of us get frustrated in our lives is because our lives have become stretches of stagnation in places that God has called us to move and go. God is always moving, and he wants your life to be a part of the movement. If you don't believe me, look at his name. Two-thirds of God's name is go. He literally says go, and I want you to be a part of the movement with me. In Matthew 5, Jesus says this, and I love this. This is where we bring it back. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. He says, you aren't meant to hide away. Yet instead, go tell people about me. Verse 16, in the same way, let your good deeds, your what? Your good deeds shine out for all to see. Jesus says, go, but don't just go. Go and display goodness so that those around you might see me through you. So back to the lame man in this passage. He's been stuck in the same spot, in the same place for years with no movement. Imagine how difficult it must have been for him to watch everyone else around him get into the very place that he probably wanted to be and go. But day after day for 40 years, people would pass him by, not lending a hand at all. And so I'm going to get theological with you just for a moment. 
Um, the description of this crippled man emphasizes his hopeless condition. And although he didn't choose to be crippled, this man demonstrates the vivid illustration of the lost sinner, track with me, who is born lame, can't walk, is separated from God, and waits outside God's temple begging for satisfaction. We've all been there, or you're there now. And so I ask you this question this morning. Who are you in this story? Who are you in Acts 3? Are you the crippled man stuck and seeking satisfaction from this world with little concept of God's goodness? Or are you like Peter and John, seeking the goodness of God overflowing from your heart that allows you to not only see people, but help people move? Once you reap God's goodness, can I tell you something? You start to sow God's goodness. And because, it is, because of that, it is then that you operate out of an overflow from your heart. Why? Because goodness comes from the overflow of your heart, not just the lending of your hand. And I'll, I'll be honest, Peter and John, they've both been stuck before. They've both been crippled before. Not physically, but they have been in situations where they did not see God's goodness. And so how, how can we take two people that have been in that spot before and, and, and see them do what they're doing in Acts 3? How did they go from that to, to, to literally lending their hearts and helping someone up. That's goodness. How did they get there? Well, in order to understand that, in order to understand how they got to that point, you've got to understand where this all started. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take us on a field trip just briefly, okay? If you, if you came here not expecting to, get, to go on a field trip, <laughs> joke's on you. We're about to go on a field trip. Look at the person next to you and say, buckle up, because here we go. Say it. I like you guys talking to each other. I like, I like interaction. Okay, here we go. Field trip. Stop number one, Genesis 3. Going back to Genesis 3, Adam and Eve did what they weren't supposed to do based on selfish decisions and wrong motives, and because of that, they were stuck. And because they were stuck, we all got stuck in that moment. And I like to put myself in, 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 in situations and just kind of view it from a, a different standpoint. So Adam and Eve are stuck, and so I see God looks down and sees, sees that. So he calls a meeting between Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and he says, guys, come here. I need one of you guys to go down there and get them unstuck. I, I, need, I need your help. So he looks at Jesus, and he says, hey, this is you, buddy. I need you big time right now. I need you to go save humanity because they're stuck. And so Jesus stands on the balcony of heaven, and he jumps off. And it takes 42 generations from Abraham for him to get to earth. There's a lot of stuck going on during that. And so 42 generations later, he lands inside the belly of a virgin where Mary starts feeling a little bit weird and she goes to her husband and says, I think I'm pregnant. And Joseph says, I think you're pregnant. And then Jesus is born. Jesus is now on earth. So fast forward 30 years. John the Baptist is baptizing somebody in water and he looks over and sees Jesus walking towards him and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, the one I was telling you guys about. I baptize in water, but he baptizes in fire and with the Holy Spirit. So they meet in the water, and John baptizes Jesus. Jesus then spends the next three years of his life healing the sick, raising the dead, and helping the poor. He's later crucified, placed inside of a tomb, yet conquers the grave, raises three days later, and then ascends back up to heaven to rejoin this meeting. And he looks at God and says, done, mission accomplished. So God looks at the Holy Spirit and says, now it's your turn. And that brings us to where we are. Check this out. This is unbelievably beautiful. And I love how the Bible just correlates and puts itself together. Watch this. In Acts chapter two, right before Acts chapter three, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. And it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit. And who was in that room? Peter and John. So from that moment, it takes us back 
to Acts chapter three and helps us understand the goodness displayed by Peter and John. Why? Because now they're full of the Holy Spirit. So they walk from Acts chapter two across the pages into Acts chapter three where we see the first recorded miracle from the birth of the new church. And what was that miracle? The healing of the crippled and lame man. Um, they didn't just help someone with their hands. Because of the overflow from their hearts, they were able to do much more than that. Why? Because goodness comes from the overflow of your heart, not just the lending of your hand. But here's the catch, y'all. This is where this is absolutely incredible. One of the most important parts of the entirety of Acts chapter 3. Read it with me again. As they approached the temple, a man lame from birth, right, was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called the beautiful gate, so he could beg from the people going into the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. Peter and John looked at him intently, and Peter said, look at us. I I imagine this lame man doesn't see anything different this day than he has the past 40 years, right? People come and people go, and then he sees these two men walking up to him and does what he's done every single day. And as he's literally sitting there or laying there, he puts his cup up, nods his head down, and he's just waiting to hear the change hit the bottom of that cup. But nothing's happening. And then he hears this, look at us. And so he raises his hand, I mean, he raises his head and looks at Peter and John. Look at us, they exclaim. These men, full of the spirit and goodness of God, are caring not for what he wants, but for what he needs. Look at us, they exclaim. Verse five. The man looked at him eagerly, expecting some money. The only thing he could do was look. He couldn't move, he couldn't walk, he couldn't jump, so he he looked. Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I do have. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. Out of the goodness in their hearts, listen, y'all. Out of the goodness in their hearts, they helped this man. But because they wanted to help him spiritually, guess what? It healed him physically. Grabbed his hand and helped this man stand to his feet. If you have the opportunity to display goodness, if you have the opportunity to display goodness, are you helping others out or are you keeping others down? Goodness comes from the overflow of your heart, not just the lending of your hand. I think so many of us think that being good is, yeah, I can offer you a hand, I'll help you out. And that's great but where's your heart? Are you doing it for yourself or are you doing it for the Lord? Goodness comes from the overflow of your heart, not just the lending of your hand. And then as we close, Acts 3 verse 8 says this. He jumped up, stood on his feet and began to walk. Then walking, leaping and praising God, he went into the temple with them. All the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. When they realized he was the lame beggar they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. Goodness, y'all, is not just helping someone up, but making sure they walk. That's goodness. That's what Acts chapter 3 the goodness means. That's the goodness found in Galatians 5:22. Peter and John could have easily just passed this man up and moved on. But it was their desire to not only see him stand, but make sure he got to where he was going. And that, my friends, is the goodness described in Galatians. So, as we close, my wife and I, (laughs) we're in Mini Farms, Arizona. Yep, let's go back. Go back with me. We're in Many Farms, Arizona. Truck won't start. I'm on my last leg. And um, I'm pulling fuse after fuse, trying to figure out what has happened. And um, this guy, this guy comes up to me and he says, hey, I've, uh, 
I actually have a mechanic shop right across the street. I can tow you to where you need to go. And I said, excuse me, sir. (laughs) Thank you, but I've been towed all over this town and Moab, and I just don't want to be towed anywhere else. I just want to get home. So this man says, okay, no worries. Thank you. Um, So he he moves on, and then uh, another guy comes up to me, and and he says, (laughs) oh, yeah, this was testing my patience right here. He said, uh... I, I've had some issues with the bank lately, and some funds fell through, and I'm just looking for um, some money. And I said, oh, <laughs> me too. I said, excuse me, sir, but I've got enough problems of my own right now. I'm looking for money. I just spent a lot of money that I didn't want to spend, and I had to stay in mo- Long story, sir. Um, he goes, oh, truck problems? I said, nailed it, <laughs> to say the least. He points behind him, and he says, Church. There's a church. You go pray. God answers prayers. And I said, I'm sure he does. But this trip, (laughs) I haven't seen it. So he walks on. um, And then one other guy. One other guy stands by my wife. She's standing by the driver's seat of of this truck. Um, I was like, babe, you need to get as far away from the driver's seat as you possibly can because something happens every time you stand there or sit in it. So this guy literally says this. I can help you. He says, I can help you. And I said, sir, I don't know if you actually can. Um, Long story short, we've been stuck in Moab for over a week now, and this truck decided to die, and there's a lot going on. I don't think, I'm on the phone with Ford right now. They're helping. His wife is at the pump next to us, and she says, trust him, he knows what he's doing. Trust him, he knows what he's doing. I was like, I don't know if he does. Um, Ford doesn't even know what they're doing. So I'm on the phone with Ford, and they tell me to go to the passenger side pull out a fuse in the passenger side uh, fuse panel. So I do that, pulling fuse after fuse. And then I hear this, hey, come down here. I'm like, God, I'm already down here and I'm stuck. You come down here. Um, he said, come down here. So I walk around the truck and I peek my head underneath. Y'all, this, this guy had meandered his way all the way underneath my, I couldn't see his head or his feet. He was laying like parallel with the truck. He says, come down here. I said, sir, what are you doing? (laughs) What are you doing? He said, I need you to get off the phone and come down here with me. So I was like, all right, Ford. um, I'm gonna call you back because there's a man under my truck and I don't know what he's doing. And so get off the phone, crawl underneath the truck and y'all like, we're both laying there underneath my truck and he points up, he says, you see that? That's your problem. And I said, (laughs) but the entirety of the truck because I understand that's my problem. He goes, no, this part right here. He said, this is the shifting linkage, and it popped off. And so you can't go from park to drive without this on there, and the truck will not start unless the shifting linkage is is placed on. He said, watch this. I'm going to put this on, and I want you to get back in the truck and turn it over. You guys will be good to go. And I was like, no way is this real. So I get in the driver's seat, and my wife is standing there. I look at her, and I said, babe, just get on the phone with the tow company. We're going to have to tow this thing all the way back to, to Phoenix. Um, he pops it on. He says, all right, turn it over. And I was like, that's the most beautiful sound I've ever heard in my entire life. I don't like the truck, but what a beautiful sound that is. So this guy pops out from underneath, and I said, how did you know how to do that? And he said, I've been working on Fords for over 30 years. I said, I can tell. And I said, are you passing through? Like, where are you going? Um, Because... I don't know if you know this, but we're in a town called Many Farms, Arizona. He goes, funny you ask. I'm actually on the way to save my family. I didn't think anything of it at that point. I'm like, well, good for you. Um, And then I said, can I at least pay for your gas? To which he responded, hey, man, don't worry about it. It's already been paid for. And so I I get in the driver's seat of this truck. My wife hops in the passenger seat because, remember, she's not driving anymore. And um, we look up, and he's gone. Him and his wife are gone. I don't know what kind of car they were driving. I don't remember what they looked like. But they just disappeared. Can I I tell you something? The PCM problem that I had in Moab was very disconnected to what happened in Many Farms, Arizona. Shifting linkage fell off. And the more I thought about it, the more it hit me. This man said, I can help you, not can I help you. He said, I can help you. The person he was with said, trust him, he knows what he's doing. 
I'm on the way to save my family. Don't worry, it's already been paid for. I need you to get off the phone and crawl underneath the truck with me. And as we were under the truck, he not only fixed the problem, but he showed me what to do in case the problem existed again. That is goodness. He could have easily just said, all right, you guys are good to go. You're on your way. It's fixed. But no, he cared enough about me because out of the overflow of his heart, he said, you know what? I need you to get down here with me. This is your problem. So if it happens again, you're good. But I promise you from this point forward, you're going to get home and you'll make it fine. No issues with the truck the five and a half hours we got home. I sold it the first day we got back home, so I no longer have it. If you have a Ford, biggest thing you can do for yourself is just get rid of it. Um, This guy not only fixed my problem, but walked with me so that it wouldn't happen again. Goodness, yes, God is good. Goodness is not about what you do but who you are. And let me tell you something, that man in many farms, Arizona, that was goodness. I think goodness came in the form of that man and everything that happened in Moab led up to that moment and I needed that to happen. I think God is trying to tell somebody in here, would you get off the phone with whoever you think can fix the problem because I can fix it. And once I fix it, I'm gonna walk with you through it. And when I walk with you through it, you're gonna be able to display goodness to everyone else around you. Why? Because it's the overflow of your heart now and not just you operating on your own. That is goodness. That is goodness. Goodness comes from the overflow of your heart not just the lending of your hand. And so I ask you today, who can you display goodness towards when you leave this place? God, would you, ah, God, would you just begin to stir in our hearts? Um, God, goodness, and, and goodness that only comes from you. God, would we operate from the goodness of what is in our hearts, God, the overflow of what is in our hearts, Lord. And that overflow only comes from you. So God, I pray for the lost and distanced and crippled and lame person in this room right now. God, that doesn't know who you are, God, would they surrender their lives to you, asking that you would be the Lord and Savior of their life, God. From that moment, God, would you, would you help us display and understand the goodness that only comes from you. God, give us opportunities today to help somebody, but not only help somebody, walk with them through it. Because the coolest part about that whole story is the fact that Peter and John not only helped him out, but walked with him into the very place he'd wanted to go for 40 years. God, I thank you for the power in your word. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, I'm going to challenge you guys with something real quick. On your way out, Hope for the Homeless has bags out there. One way you can display goodness, man, let's, let's get rid of all of those bags today. Let's take everything off those tables. Go, go give them to somebody, but don't just give them to somebody. Have a conversation if you have the opportunity and time to do so, because it's crazy what God will do when you say, I'm willing, I'm ready, okay? Love you guys. Go display goodness to somebody, and we'll see you guys next week.